you post when you post a video in an announcement in Brightspace, the learners get the text, but the video, it doesn't link to it. So I always make sure I put a link to it. But one of the things I started doing is when you go to YouTube, you can get the transcript. And I put the transcript into ChatGPT. And I say, can you just take that transcript and parse it down into Markdown? So ChatGPT will also give me the Markdown and then I can put, paste it in. What that does is when the learner gets an email with this midweek check-in, they get a link to the video, but they can also see exactly what I talked about. So if they don't feel like watching the video, then this does a very, very good job. Um, so Markdown is very ubiquitous under the hood. It exists in places um, that we don't even know. So to answer your question <laughs> about how you do this again once you decorate your text and i think i'm going to put in a jumbotron here so this is let me zoom in so you can see what the jumbotron looks like jumbo message that gives you this bar and by the way aaron was smart enough to say like oh i actually think we should have different colors that we can choose from and you'll note that the heading one heading two and heading three changes to no matter how i change this um so he did a good job color coding it um, and, and I tend to color code my courses and um, just a disclaimer, I don't use it to ever differentiate information because I know that's not an accessible thing, but it, but I, I like to do it and it, I have themed colors uh, because I'm, I'm a little over the top. But at any rate, once you develop your text here and you kind of craft it however you want it to be, then you just hit the copy HTML button and you cannot paste it right here, which is a very common mistake. You have to go to this source code and paste it there. And then you'll see, let me just, I'll put jumbo message in there. Um, and I'm gonna hide it from the users just so they don't know it's there. When I hit save and close, and I know the color is a little off here, um, that's just a bright space artifacting. Um, but when I hit save and close, then you can see that it renders like with the colors and, and all that. So. This tool is meant to take your text and with very, very small, simple things like two pound signs for heading two, one pound sign for heading one. Um, it automatically makes this text. I don't even know what size, what font this size is. Um, I think it's like Lado 19 or something like that. But it, I like this text better than um, better than the default text that comes in Brightspace. So even if I was just doing text, Even if I was just doing text, I would still use this tool. Um, and I'm just going to overwrite this. I would still use this tool because I think it the just it, the just the text is better than the default in Brightspace. It's a little bit easier to read, um, and it, it's uh, a little bit bigger, especially when you're on mobile. So I use this software for everything I do in Brightspace. Uh, I'm going to pause there for questions. Does anyone have any questions? I wanted to ask about, because uh, in a lot of classes that I take, instructors use watching the video or clicking on the video as kind of like counting towards participation points. Um, do you find if you can't track which of your students have watched the video versus just read the transcripts uh, affects uh, how well they're interacting with the content? Uh, I, I would say that, I, I guess I have two responses. I, the only place I do the transcript is in the announcements because the video doesn't get sent through the announcement tool um, right. in the email. So that's why I do the transcript. I do know that whenever I put a video in my course, it's I probably 99.9% .9 of the time it's a YouTube video, which has a transcript anyhow. Mm -hmm. And I know when I go through online courses, I much prefer the transcript than the video. Um, and if I watch the video, I'll watch it at like two or three times any speed anyhow. So uh, I, I guess my personal preference, and I, I suspect there's research to suggest this, says that whatever people are more comfortable with how they consume their information is probably the best way that they should be consuming it. Although I do want to temper that, recognizing that in almost every case I know about learning, um, user, learners tend to over-index their favorite modality and tend to gravitate towards the easiest modality, not necessarily the most efficient. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, 
So I'm aware of that. And I try to make sure that I'm like keeping that in the back of my mind. So I don't know, but I do know that I like to offer it in multiple modalities. I actually don't watch, I don't monitor how often my learners are watching their videos, the videos, um, because I think that's, I don't know if that's a fool's errand or not, at least for the content that I'm teaching. Um, mm -hmm. be, because like I'm making my own video demos and there could be tons of researchers out there that are better than the stuff I'm putting out there anyhow. So, so I don't do that. Um, but I mostly put the transcript in the condensed transcript. So I'll take the transcript and condense it and put it in the messages. Although there are plenty of tools where you can go to a website, put in a YouTube video and it will behind the scenes, take the transcript, run it through AI and give you like 20 bulleted points or 10 bulleted points. So like, there's a good chance learners are doing that anyhow. Yeah, as a student, that's what I do with my videos a lot of times unless, you know, because that's something that I can easily take the time to read, whereas I probably don't have 30 minutes to an hour to watch a whole lecture. Yeah. Uh, so extracting the transcript is something that I do, but I also know I have to do this arbitrary, go out there and click it because a lot of our instructors will check for clicks, you know, did, did this learner actually watch this video through to the end? So I just have to arbitrarily let it play while my headphones aren't on my head. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. How does that make you feel uh, as some, like a learner in the class? It's good that they have it there. So it, it's kind of two pronged, right? Like one part of it is, is that yes, it's there for the people who need that visual stimulation to connect with the content. Mm -hmm. um, but as somebody who works full time, has kids, has other obligations and things like that. I feel like it's an arbitrary task, right? Like you're just trying to give me more things that you can grade me on. Um, yeah. And if I'm showing you and illustrating in the other ways that I know what I'm doing in the class, I feel like this is just to check a box. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, and I agree completely. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that, but um, it, because that is like an instructional design premise. And quite frankly, I don't even have the time to be policing, like who's watching what videos in my course. I kind of want to see the work they're producing, like you said. And if that mm -hmm. re reflects it, great. If it doesn't, okay, then, then there's an issue. So um, I, I think you kind of like hit the nail on the head as far as like instructional design is concerned. Um, and like, frankly, like authentic, genuine assessments in the course. Anyhow, if it's just watching a video, that's kind of like pedestrian. There's no reason to be doing that. <laughs> I agree. I agree. But it's one of those things that I continue to see happen. And I'm like, okay, so where does the best practices side of this fall? So I appreciate your response. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you asking that question because it's, um, it, and it's only going to be getting worse because AI is going to like, uh, well, that, that's a whole nother conversation. And when I say worse, I don't mean like it, it, as a bad thing. I'm just saying there'll be, be more options that people can be doing. And, and we as instructional designers and educators are going to have to be aware of that and leverage those tools and those the new paradigms to make our courses better. Yeah, I've been seeing a lot of articles lately talk about how AI is not necessarily a bad thing in the classroom, but it's teaching our students how to use it, um, you know, to effectively learn. And so I, as I've been learning more and more about AI, I've been finding ways to take some of these less uh well-produced courses uh, and it, take materials like PowerPoints and things like that and drop them into things like Copilot to develop practice tests so that I have a study guide because yeah. uh, some of our instructors just don't provide the materials. So, Yeah, and, and this is, uh, I wish we could talk about AI all day because yeah. I, this is a bit of a passion project for me. There's two books I do want to recommend and one tool. Um, one of the books, Dan Levy and Angela Perez Albertos did, uh, wrote this book. It's like three ninety nine on Amazon called Teaching Effectively with Chat GPT, and they were on the T for Teaching podcast that comes out of SUNY Oswego a few weeks ago. And I read the book. I've read a number of books on AI in education. This is one of the best because it really shows you how important it is to craft your prompt. And they give you probably fifty percent of the book is prompts that they use and the results they get. And it's it's life changing when it comes to AI. And they do have a section on how learners can use it too. The other book that I would recommend is called. I guess I'll just do it this way. Um, it's by Jose Bowen. Bowen. Um, I think it's called Teaching with AI. I highly recommend this book as well because this is more of a 30,000 foot view of using AI, but it, it has, um, it's more about an instruction in the classroom and how you can like plug it into your course. So I'd recommend those two books on AI, Teaching with AI by Jose Bowen. Um, and oops. And the other book was the book by Dan Levy. Uh, 
uh, teaching effectively with ChatGPT. And ChatGPT is just kind of a proxy for um, any, of the, any of the generative AI platforms. Um, and then the tool, this is just a freebie. Uh, Aaron, what, what time do I have to stop presenting? Um, technically 10.45. Okay. Just, just because there's another one at 11. So yeah, as yeah, long yeah. as you're done before that one starts. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, the, the last tool that I wanna show you is something called Notebook LM. Have, have you used this? Has anyone used Notebook LM? Yeah, I've seen that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just heard somebody talking about it the other day, though. Yeah. It, it's really, really cool. You can upload, in this particular case, I just have one PDF. Um, in this particular case, I have two PDFs. But you can upload uh, any PDFs, websites, YouTube videos, any Google Docs or Google Slides you have. So this gives you the body for the law, the language model. And then all the content that you derive from this. So um, for instance, I can say like, hey, give me a study guide. Or I can say like, develop 10 multiple choice questions. Um, oh my goodness. All of this content is derived from exclusively this, my set, whatever I decide to upload. Um, and it will, this is freaking bonkers. It generates a podcast that's very natural speaking. It has like ums and ahs and filler words and they have like jokes. If you haven't heard any of the podcasts from Notebook LM, you've got to try it out because it is absolutely bonkers. Um, so what I do is I, for each chapter in my classes, I load in all the content from each chapter and then I develop a podcast and let them listen to it. It tends to be um, a little bit like, introductory like high level it doesn't have to be um but anyhow that that's all that's that's a freebie you get from coming here if you haven't used notebook lm i think this is the most underrated piece of uh, educational technology in the world today okay so going back to here um let me just pick a youtube video and i'm just going to pick a random youtube video oh <laughs> uh if you have a youtube video and, and and oftentimes we do for a course, whether we make ourselves or that we um, curate for our learners. If you go to share and embed, you can just copy this code. And in the tool that we have, this Markdown for Works, uh, Markdown to Brightspace, um, you can, if you prepend it with this, so if you just do carrot YouTube. And I'll talk about what the carrot means in a minute. And then just paste in what you have. It makes this YouTube video. And um, what you what you can't see is that it resizes it automatically. So no matter if a learner is on like a um, cell phone or a tablet, like everything in the software is, is what we say is responsive. Um, and, and so Aaron is taking care of all the responsiveness. So I think it's at a point where I want to show you kind of like the, the five or six commands in Markdown that I think are, are the easiest to use and the, the ones that you, you should maybe practice if you're feeling brave over the next few days. And then if you're feeling like you, you're a glutton for punishment on Thursday, come back and we'll do some of the more advanced stuff. And I'll, I'll tease what that looks like um, before we leave. But so the very first thing that I think is important to know is the Jumbotron. And again, I'll send out a cheat sheet for this later. And the Jumbotron, I'm going to go back to the geometry paradigm. Um, the Jumbotron is what gives you that bar. And then the, the second command that I think is really important to know uh, is this heading one. So we'll do like triangles. And then maybe I know in this outline we're going to do circles. And then maybe I know in this outline... Uh, we're going to do parallelogram, uh, quadrilaterals. So right now it's rendering it and I can come in and put my text. Actually, I think I have this cute little web extension that lets me put in um, three or four paragraphs of lorem ipsum, which is just place filler text. So I'm just going to put that underneath the quadrilaterals one and also in, in circles. So now we have different text here. Um, so I think the very first thing that you need to know is that the two carrots gives you the jumbotron. And whatever you put after the two carrots, that's what's going to be in the jumbotron. Anytime you see a carrot 
in, in what we're talking about today and also on Thursday, that means that's custom markdown, which means it will work in, in what I'm showing you in this tool, but it, it's not canonical uh, markdown. It's not what's widely accepted globally. Anything that doesn't start with a carrot is globally accepted as markdown. So this is this this one um, pound sign is generic markdown. And then of course you can have uh, two pound signs to get into the subheading or the heading number two. Um, and you can do heading number three and four and five. I think it goes down to six, um, but just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to make it two. The, so the first thing that I want you to walk away with is this Jumbotron. And again, I think the best case scenario of it is when we were looking at this content right here, it's a good way to break up your subfolders. All I did was Jumbotron in the description. I could have put other text in there too, but I just wanted to really break this apart. The second thing is headings one through six are between one and six of these pound signs, these hashtags. The third thing that I think is really easy to use and worth investigation is um, bullet points. So if you want to do bullets, you just do one asterisk and you type uh, right angle. And then you do another asterisk and type uh, obtuse angle. And then another one, and you can do acute angle. I guess there's reflex angles too. So asterisks is for a bulleted list. And if you wanted to indent that, you just do one, two, um, And then you get the sub bullets. So you can do bullets from a bulleted list. You can also do, if you prefer, you can have numbered lists and you can just do like one, um, and it will automatically append that as a numbered list. So Jumbotron, double carrot. Headings with your pound signs and bullet lists. That gets you a lot of places. That gets you um, probably a lot of your content. If you're just looking to dump your content into a canvas, that'll get you there. Um, it is worth also mentioning that if you want text to be bold, oops, it's two carats. Or I'm sorry, not two carats. Um, in fact, I'm gonna move this somewhere else. I'm gonna move this up top just so I don't have to scroll up this on the right and the left. So two asterisks will make it bold, whereas one asterisk will be italicized. Um, and then the last one, which I use a lot, and again, I teach computer science, is called a back tick. And it's the key that you probably never ever press before in your life, it's to the left of the one, it's underneath the tilde. It is not a single apostrophe. That's a single apostrophe. A back tick is this. And if you just type in like geometry.pdf, then it puts it in this monospace font and it makes it look, you know, like a file name or computer code or something like that. So those are the, the bare essentials. Um, and I'll go over it one more time. Double caret will get you the jumbotron between one and six. This is actually called an octothorpe. Between one and six octothorpes will give you headings one through six. If you want to make text bold, just use two stars or two asterisks before and after. And by the way, if you wanted to have bold and italics, it would just be three stars. Um, and then the back tick gets you a monospace font and asterisks in a row give you, or I'm sorry, in, in, in a list will give you your bullets and numbers will give you a numbered list. One of the interesting things about this numbered list, by the way, is once you start that one, it kind of understands it. So if you type in the wrong numbers, 
this software will correct you and be like, no, it should be one, two, three. It's not one, four, three. So you actually can't override the numbers if you want to. Um, but uh, this is a good safeguard for that. Um, and then the last one, and again, I showed this to you before, is if you want to embed a video in a YouTube video, go to share, embed, copy that code, but prepend it, oops, prepend it please with Aaron's YouTube um, tag. So again, that would look like one carrot, YouTube, and then you just paste in what you had. Um, and that's all there is to it. Now, there's, I, I know there's five minutes left, so I'm gonna take up two more minutes and then we can have like a three minute conversation if you want. I do wanna show you something that is kind of cool with this software um, because a, a, a question, a guiding principle should be like, this should not be ephemeral. You want to keep this because if you want to make a change to it in the future, it's much easier to change a text file than it is to go in here and like edit whatever you want to do. So what I suggest you do is whenever you're doing this, I always copy the markdown and I save it into a text file. And then I, you know, I can just call this like markdowns. That's a terrible name for it. It should probably be called geometry or whatever. And then I store all of them in like say Google Drive or whatever, so that when I go back, I can edit the root, the 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 ground truth version of it, and then just dump it back in here. So I'm going to show you right now. This is where all my courses are. Um, so I'll pick like this ed tech class, and I'll go into I don't know the chapter on Google Docs. This is all the markdown for it. So I can just copy this code. And again, I use GitHub. You don't need to use GitHub um, to, to track your files. I just do because it's a lot easier. So I can come back, make any changes I need to here. And then I can copy this code and put it back in my original document, which is right here. So, um, but one thing that, Aaron has done is he's made it such that if you use his software to make content, let's say like, uh, oh, here's an example of a podcast I, I made with Notebook LM. If I, so I made his, I use his software to make this. If I edit the HTML of it, If you scroll down to the HTML, you actually see it has the markdown in it, which doesn't render for the learner. But the nice benefit of that is in this software right here, if I paste in that HTML, it will strip out all the HTML and still give me the markdown. So I have all the markdown here. Oops. Um, I have all the markdown here that I, I otherwise wouldn't have had. So, um, but I prefer to keep all my files separate and keep them all here just because if I'm sharing a course with someone else, if they have access to this document that you see on the screen and I have access to it, we can both make changes to it. And this is the one place where we can guarantee is the ground truth of our content. Okay, and with that, I see we have two minutes left. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, did I stop sharing my screen? You did. Okay, and if, does anyone have any questions? I will say, Dave, I know you're going to give us a handout of what you covered so that mm -hmm. that helps for those coming back on Thursday for the um, kind of intermediate session. Um, but also in Markdown, there is the um, the quick guide um, and you can look up some of those. Um, yeah, can I show that real tags. quick? Yeah. Thank you for- so, uh, Just so folks will know in case they- Yeah, so if you, if you come to this document, there is this, or this website, there is a quick guide and you can say, oh, well, I wanna do, bold and then not only do we give you an example of how to do it um and maybe links is a better uh or columns and lists um for anything other than this the basics here we give you the ability to copy the code and then so say you wanted to do two columns you would just put both columns in there and just paste it in and change it. So this gives you kind of a way to do it. And Loy, I saw you put a link in there for perplexity in their spaces. Um, I think all the AIs are going to have them. I think perplexity is actually probably one of the best for like factual stuff. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. 
Um, but the, I do want to just tease what we're going to be doing next on Thursday is show you how to do these like super slick um, uh, accordions, how to do the difference between like, uh, these are called tabs. And this is uh, just like an example of a call out box where you can submit your work and put all sorts of different icons in there. We're going to be going over um, kind of just like how your courses can look with some of the more, um, more potent tools in that software suite. Um, so I think that's where I'll end. And I do, oh, there is one other thing. If you are kicking the tires on it, this drop down, there's a difference between a Brightspace web page file and a Brightspace description. The web page is when you create a new HTML. A description is when you're making like an announcement or if you have like at the, the top of any particular chapter when you just click in to change the description. So the the way you need to kind of know the difference between those two it, because it depends where you're pasting your code. So I would, um, if you're, if, if I were you, I would start with the web page, and then um, because I think that's a better representation of the software, but you might need to change it to a description if you're doing, for instance, so this is a web page, this, um, that, this podcast thing that I showed you, but a description would be like an announcement or like this right here is a description. Okay, now I'm done talking. Um, I really apologize for, for all of that. Okay, good. Are there other questions? Oh, okay. Thanks, Lloyd. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, coconut. I've never heard of that, but I'm writing it down. <laughs> Let's check it out. So on, on Thursday, we'll do like double columns and how to do accordions with one of the, uh, I think, downsides to the Brightspace templates that we have is that you can either choose accordion or a tab thing. You can't do both because it will wipe it out. But this software lets you like really customize. You can do accordions with the tab things. You can do two columns. You can do all sorts of crazy wonky stuff. Awesome. Yeah, and you can do both. I think you need to like do a little bit of like massaging with the HTML. Is that right? Or have they fixed that? Probably easier in audio, but no, you have to go into the HTML and you basically have to copy one HTML into another HTML and put yeah. them together, but it can be done, yeah. Yeah, um, the, the, so hopefully that when when we reconvene Thursday, um, I'll I'll show you kind of uh, how I handle that in, in the, in the markdown, because it's way easier. I think um, one of the other things that those templates have like six accordions. So if you want four or eight, you need to understand the HTML to parse it. Whereas markdown makes it a lot easier. And uh, Aaron, I will get you the handout of the things we covered today. Okay. Um, and then on Thursday, if people have questions, but in the meantime, go out and try it. Like yeah, kick play the around with it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and we'll post that along with the recording on the same website, you know, where you found all the sessions today. We're going to be doing slides and recordings for each session um, and any additional resources all right in one spot. Um, and I also just want to let you know, if, if you're not familiar already with the USDLA uh, website, maybe check out what they have to offer, not just for National Distance Learning Week, but they have a lot of distance learning resources there. Um, but they are also showcasing sessions around the country uh, for this week, including all of our SUNY online sessions. So thanks again, Dave. I always learn something new, um, even after knowing you all this time. Uh, I am leaving the Zoom room open. Uh, our next session starts at 11, and it's the, in the same spot. And it is going to be on using Padlets and Google Forms. Um, specifically, this is a mathematics instructor, but it does apply to other courses. So thanks again for joining us, and thank you to Dave. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.